All right, so we will be recording, yeah. right? Is it okay? Yes. Yes, please. Uh, welcome, everybody, to uh, online interviewability journal club. And today I'm very I'm glad to introduce uh, Dristan McLaughlin from Trinity College Dublin, uh, who will tell us how to go from integrability to quantum chaos in n equal postcranials. Tristan, please. Okay. Um, yeah, so of course, the first thing is to thank the organizers for this opportunity. Um, this is actually my first Zoom talk. I've given a bunch of lectures, but this is the first Zoom talk, so I'm interested to see how it goes. Um, and the work I want to talk about is work that was done in collaboration with um, Raul Pereira, who's a postdoc here in Dublin, and Anna Spearing, who's a PhD student. And it's based on, on, on this work that appeared earlier this year, and then some paper that's hopefully going to appear. Um, uh, of course, always tempting fate, but actually should appear in the next day or so. Um, and so, of course, I'm assuming that for this audience, you know, everyone's going to be familiar with n equals four and whatnot, but just to sort of um, specify the context in which I'm going to be discussing, um, I'm going to be looking at the SU2 sector of um, SUN n equals four super young mills. Um, a little bit, we'll look at the, I'll mention the SL2 sector and so on, but um, really everything I have to say has to do with uh, rank one sectors and particularly the SU2 sector. And so for this, Part of the theory, the operators are, um, I'm just going to consider the multi-trace operators made out of two complex scalars. And so all my operators are going to be of, of this uh, sort of form. Um, and the key thing we're going to be interested in is the dilatation operator. So we're interested in the spectrum of anomalous dimensions. Um, and of course, this has been known for quite some time. So this is the um, one loop uh, dilatation operator. Um, so here G is the, well, actually that's not quite right. Um, yeah, well, anyway, this is the, the, the coupling. Um, N is the rank of the gauge group, as I said. And the effect of the dilatation operator really is, is just, it's sort of, it, it, it acts on pairs of, of, these, of these letters. Actually, that isn't working very well. It acts on pairs of these letters, um, an X and a Z. Um, and then sort of gives you combinations back where it switches them. And in the planar limit where everybody, you know, knows how it works and so on, you just get this nearest neighbor spin chain picture. But more generally, it can just act on non-adjacent um, spins. And when it acts on non-adjacent spins, it'll sort of either, you know, split a single trace apart or join traces together. So that's what this, this hat notation means. It just sort of acts as a functional derivative on operators in, in these traces and then either um, joins them together, splits them, and sort of shifts them back and forth. And in particular, it shifts them back and forth in a similar way to it acts in the planar limit where you got the familiar XXZ, XXX um, spin chain. So acting on multi-trace um, operators, you can just sort of act and read off the coefficients. And, and you'll find, of course, a big matrix. Um, and the matrix will organize itself into different parts. Um, there's some uh, leading part. So this is the this is the planar um, Hamiltonian, which is the integrable part. And then, so the, the planar part, of course, will just take a single trace and give you back a single trace. But then there's other pieces um, that are suppressed by factors of uh, one over n. So there's a part that, for example, will um, take a, a single trace and split it into um, two, two individual traces. So that's sort of actually the other way around, actually. Sorry, and H minus is the one that takes, uh, say, a double trace operator, which I'm sort of writing like this, um, and gives you back a single trace operator. So that's what this picture was supposed to be uh, representing. So you get these sort of pair of pants um, type pictures. But of course, it acts also on triple trace and, and, and so on. So I want to talk about the spectrum of anomalous. So obviously, we know essentially everything um, about the, the planar spectrum. But we want to understand what can we say about the, the non-planar parts. So the first thing I want to talk about, so in this talk, there's sort of, I want to talk about two things, which perhaps is one too many, but hopefully not too, too many. Um, and, and the first thing I want to talk about is just essentially some sort of numerical investigations of the spectrum, just so that we have some sort of intuition of what the spectrum looks like. And also because, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to study. 
So one of the most sort of generic features that we would expect um, at finite n um, is, is that if we uh, study the, um, the anomalous dimensions or energies, as I'm of course often going to call them, um, if we have, um, so if we study them as some function of some parameter, so for example, of the Etuft coupling, um, if there's, if there's uh, two, two different levels, um, in, in the limit where n is, is very large, in general, we can expect these, these levels to, to cross as a function of lambda, while at um, finite n, if we look at the same um, spectrum, we sort of expect these uh, levels to, to repel each other with some sort of separation that goes like one over n squared. Now, given- Sorry, that, could, could I ask at this point, is it SUN or ON or it doesn't matter? The gauge group, is that what you mean? Yes. Yeah, yeah no, no, very important. So yeah, it's, it's SUN, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Um, yeah. Can you say some more why that is very important? I, I will a little bit. So it, it, it's, it, no, you know something? it probably isn't very important. It does turn up later actually, but yeah. So actually one of the re reasons it's important is, is, is here. So we can't actually consider the, the, the spectrum as a function of, um, of, of the coupling because I'm just at one loop. So we want to study, we want to introduce a different parameter. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at this uh, deformation of n equals four. So there's this n equals one deformation, um, which is this so-called uh, beta deformed theory. And this theory is, is uh, super conformal, um, but it's only super conformal for SUN, uh, for SUN gauge group. So, so there's one feature of why I need to consider SUN. There's a couple of other places it'll show up. I actually don't think that some of, like many of the more significant things I would want to say probably would be true in the UN case too. For, I couldn't consider the, the beta deform theory, but some of the other features would be true. Um, so I, I don't think it's like profoundly important, but it's also of course important to note that when we talk about holography, really the, the dual theory is I suppose meant to be dual to, to SUN, not, um, not UN. Um, Okay, so, so yeah, the, so this is super conformal. The, the planar theory is, is integrable. Oops. Um, and so it's, it's all sort of very, very nice. Um, the, the, the difference is, so th there's a difference in the coupling. So the coupling is, is, is not quite the Young-Mills coupling. It also depends on the, um, especially at finite n on, on the deformation parameter, but that's not so important. More relevant is these, uh, these commutators, the deformed commutator, has this sort of uh, this sort of form? So you introduce these phase factors, um, and then there's this uh, additional double trace term. So, so this obviously looks very similar to what we had uh, um, in the underform theory, but there's this double trace term um, which sort of vanishes completely in the in the def in the sort of underform theory. Um, it's important for super for finite n super conformal invariance. Um, and it will play some role, but again, it's probably not you know, deeply important for kind of what I want to say. Um, Does it double trace as it's inherited from that one uh, in Lagrangian? Yeah, no, ex absolutely, exactly. So the double trace term just comes from, from exactly, yeah. So you can, you can calculate it very di various different ways. Um, yeah, okay. So, so yeah, so that's, that's the, it's, so it's useful then to consider the energy let. So you, you can do the same thing. We can construct the same um, basis of states or operators, act with the dilatation operator, diagonalize the matrix. Um, if, and if we just look at like a very simple case, so if we look at the length six operators with, so, you know, sort of operators that look like, you know, there's three Zs and, and three Xs in them, but I, I mean, all of them are, or actually here's a subset. I'm not including all of them. Um, if we look at if we look at sort of the n goes to infinity limit, you you find that you get a diagram like the following, um, and integrable energy levels are very friendly, so they all like to um, sort of cross each other um, at, at at points, so they 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 literally come as close as you know, as you like. And um, most of the points where they cross um, are actually at values of um, beta over pi that are are rational. So th these actually generally correspond to um, points where the beta deform theory corresponds to an orbifold. 
So there are extra, extra symmetries at these points. Um, but okay, so this is, you know, we sort of see the same feature of level crossing um, as a function of the beta parameter um, in, in the spectrum. Now, if we go to, to finite n, so here- Sorry, uh, sorry Tristan, so you're saying that every time there is a crossing there, there is always a symmetry that can explain it? Mm, or not necessarily? No, I, I'm not sure if I want to make that strong a statement. Most of them are at symmetry points. I think some of them, so in particular, um, there's one guy, which I'll talk about now, but you know something? I'm not actually sure about that statement. So yeah, let me not make a strong okay. statement. Um, if, if I look at finite n, so here I'm looking at n being the same as the, the length of the operators. Yeah, I'll come back to that. Um, and, and so now you can see the, the energy levels are sort of, they're like polite English people. They sort of, you know, move around, but they, they never, they never, they never touch. So there's, you know, even, even places where they look like they get very close, even here, for example, um, you can't actually see it in the diagram, but in fact, if you zoom in on the graph, they're not actually touching. Um, they, they always say at least one over n squared away from each other. It's just here, one over n squared is like one over 36. And so it's actually quite small. However, um, so, so in general, for the most part- Sorry, so looking at the graph, it looks like there are still some crossings, but you're saying- good. No, exactly. So let me, let me just say, so, so indeed there's one, one sort of drunken Irishman or something, who uh, doesn't, um, who keeps bumping into people. And, and so this, this one um, is, uh, so this operator um, is a, so actually maybe, I think I've written this on the other slide. Yeah, so, so this operator, so there's one level in, in this case where, where it does actually cross. And, and this is a double trace state. And, and actually in this case, this double trace state doesn't mix with any of the other operators. And it actually gets no finite n corrections. And the reason is, is that here there's an extra symmetry. So because I'm at half filling, um, you can there's a there's a there's a symmetry of the operators, which basically if I flip z and x and I reverse the order of the trace, so I have this parity symmetry, which takes a trace and sort of reverses the order of it. So at half filling, there's this additional symmetry, and this this double trace operator is the only one that has negative charge with respect to that transformation. So, and, and, and that's actually a key point. If, if operators, um, uh, what do you call, have different global charges, then they don't necessarily repel each other. Then they, they yeah, they, they move around. So in order to see this level repulsion thing, you really do need to be considering operators with the same global charges. And that, that actually will, that's an important thing and, and something that we need to take into account when we want to kind of go forward. Can you show again the operator for a moment? So I haven't actually, I haven't written down what the operator is. It's just the symmetry that you show. It's it's, not oh, the symmetry, yeah. This is, I mean, so the symmetry is just exchanging Z and X and you right. flip the order of the trace. Yeah. So the, the operator is, I mean, it's just due to the symmetry. It does not have any, any other particular. I, I don't know if off the top of your head is, is something that you can write down or it's a mess. No, you know something, it's probably not that complicated, but yeah, I haven't actually, yeah. Okay, I have to, I have to, yeah. So it, it, as I say, it's, it's, it's actually quite simple because it's a double trace operator with no finite end corrections. So yeah, but I'm sorry, I can't, I can't actually remember what it is. Mm. Oh, oh, sorry, isn't it true in general that you have these uh, parity pairs with plus and minus parity in general in the spectrum? Not a finite end, is that what you mean? Oh. Or? Okay, no problem. Yeah, yeah. So here, here, sorry, I should say. So here, this is this is at finite n, right? That's the, yes. No, no, I got it. Okay. Yeah. So, but but it's true. There are still um, there are still global symmetries. So in particular, one but, thing actually uh, about uh, sorry, a bit confusing. So your parity acts on one trace, uh, right? So maybe can you? So it's double trace. What what you're saying it is? Yeah. Sorry. So it, it, it the parity flips all of the so it flips the order in all of the traces. Yeah. yeah, sorry, here I was just saying, yeah, I was just giving an example, but yeah, the transformation that flips all traces. Um, yeah, sorry, so one, one actual thing that I should mention, of course, is that um, the, the, the n equals four SU2 dilatation operator has an SU2 symmetry. Um, the, uh, the beta deformed theory doesn't have that SU2, so the sort of 
SU2 symmetry gets broken to a, a, to a U1. Um, and uh, that's another symmetry that in general, you know, when we're going to talk later, we would have to consider operators that are not related to each other by that SU2 symmetry. OK, so that's one important thing that we need to, you know, in order to see this sort of rep level repulsion, we need to consider operators that are um, have the same global charges. And Tristan, may I ask a question about the picture? Uh, do you plot uh, single trace operators or also double traces? Here, there's yeah. Here, there's a collection of single trace and double trace, and maybe even okay. double trace. No, no, I think it's just single and double. Is there a difference? I mean, qu qualitative difference between double, um, between crossing of single traces among themselves, or cross and crossings between single and double traces. I haven't specifically looked at that. I haven't noticed anything, but I haven't specifically checked that. Um, so hmm. maybe, but not not that not that I'm aware of. Yeah, yeah, I'd have to. Then uh, another question: Are you doing that at finite n, right? So, so, so this is finite. This one here is finite n, and this one here is infinite n. But then, uh, why are you only consider single and double traces in principle? No, no, no I, I consider all traces. I, I guess I was just thinking that here. So what, what, what I've actually done is I've taken out the traces that um, are protected, that have no, so there are still some protected operators. Um, and I think triple trace for length six, I don't think there's any non-protected one. I'm not sure. If, if, they're, if they're not protected, they're there. Yeah. In general, we consider all of them. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so this, this behavior, this thing where you get, where you, you know, you have a system where you have uh, level crossing and it goes to a system where the levels repel. This is characteristic of, of um, a transition from an integral system to a chaotic system. And one way to study chaos in quantum many body systems is by analyzing the um, statistical properties of, uh, of the spectrum of energies. So the so I wanted to say what the level spacings are. So we take our energies, um, E1, E2, and so on. Um, and we order them. And then we, the spacings are, well, the spacing, so there's the differences between energies. And the thing I'm going to be interested in calculating is the probability that a given spacing, um, PSDS, lies between S and S plus DS. And we can form some sort of basic expectations for what this uh, probability distributions um, should look like. Um, so, yeah, so if we, for example, consider some um, energy E um, and we want to find the probability that the next energy lies between E plus S and E plus S plus DS. Um, sorry, excuse me. And, and if we assume that the energies are uncorrelated with each other, so like in the large N case, um, we assume that the energies sort of, yeah, are, don't care about a nearby energy. So the probability of finding an energy at a, in, a given, um, in a given range um, is just proportional to the size of that range. So if we find that the probability of uh, finding uh, an energy um, between E and E plus DE, if, sorry, E plus DE, if we assume that this is just proportional to DE, um, and we're also going to assume, and, and this actually also is important, we're going to assume that the average spacing is one, so the density of the energy levels is, is one. Um, so in some sense, the coefficient here, the relative coefficient is just one. So if I want to calculate what the probability of finding an energy level uh, here is, so that's the probability, sorry, of finding the next energy level here. That's the probability of finding no energy in you know, any interval before I get to the one, and then the probability of finding one in that region. So I can break this into little, sorry, this is like E plus S over M. So I break it into sort of M, intervals. And so then the probability of um, not finding an energy is uh, 1 minus uh, s over m. So it's just the 
as I say, proportional to the size of the interval. Um, and there's m of these intervals. So the probability of not finding an energy in any of these intervals is just 1 minus s to the m. And then the probability of finding one here is just uh, ds. And then I, of course, take the limit as m goes to infinity, and I just get e to the minus s ds. So this tells me that, and, and this, this is the, is the, so this is the Poisson distribution. And it's characteristic of integrable systems. So there's been lots of numerical studies for integrable spin chains, Hubbard, TJ, lots of other systems as well. Um, and you can find that the, the distribution of the spacings does indeed satisfy this Poisson distribution. There's some analytical work, like this all goes back like to the, to the 80s by Berry and, and, and Berry and Tabor, where they had some results. And it's sort of generally true. It's not absolutely always true. So one common example, it's not true for the harmonic oscillator. Um, but it's, you know, yeah. In, in some sense, if you, if you have an integrable model, that's a family of integrable models. You, if, you, if you find one that doesn't satisfy the Poisson distribution, if you change the parameter a little bit, it will. OK, so that's, that's the, as I say, the Poisson distribution. Um, All right. the, yeah. So uh, what are, so you, you got the, the distribution out of some assumptions. And what is the link between the assumptions and integrability? So, OK, so here I'm, I'm just trying to provide like a qualitative argument. So here, what we've assumed is that the energies are uncorrelated. So that, that was sort of what's happening in this diagram. The energy levels just move around, and they don't care about the other energy levels. Right? So that's, that's the characteristic of an integrable system. They, they just move in, in space, like in energy space, you know, unaware of the other ones. So that's now the, the actual correlation is the fact that you then go and look at integral systems and check that it's true. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. I haven't proven sure, sure. anything, but, but that, that's, that's why this, this assumption that I was saying is, is gives you what you actually do find. All right. As I say, trying to prove it. So there's some, there are some analytical results usually in systems where you have a small number of degrees of freedom due to Barry and so on, where he could actually prove that this is the correct distribution. Okay, so in, in the same vein, I, I, again, the, this is, I'm just trying to form some sort of, um, yeah, I just try, try to give a reason for the results that I'm going to show in a second, um, just sort of how they come about from, from this sort of, yeah, quite sort of general idea. But, uh, so, sorry, but uh, just understand. If the goal is to show it is uh, not uh, integrable. So what I'm going to show is that in the integral case, the level spacing satisfy Poisson distribution. And now I'm going to talk about what the distribution looks like in the chaotic case. And it will be something called Wigner-Dyson. And I'll show that at finite n, you get Wigner-Dyson. At infinite n, you get Poisson. But uh, no, the, the big goal is to show that at finite n, uh this kind of quantum system which acts on all multi-traces with this uh, dilatation operator uh, is not integrable quantum system. Right, right, exactly. So you will... But then uh, cannot you just like kind of uh, perturbatively check that integrals of motion which were there before yeah, and so, they are no longer integrals of motion. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, okay, so, okay, so very good. So, no, sorry, my point is not to try and prove that it's not integrable. My, my point is to try and understand what that non integrability looks like and are there some features to that non integrability? Yeah. It's true that as a consequence, I'll sort of prove that it's not integrable, but yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, you can maybe think that that's like a zeroth order result. Yeah, yeah. But, but that's not the big goal in some sense. Okay, so I can I ask a general question? So, is there a uh, in quantum case analog of KAM theorem in classical case? So, okay. if you, yeah, so, so that's so, typical, will be typical. yeah, that, that's a whole literature, um, and the answer is kind of it's way less clear than in the classical case. Um, and people keep writing papers saying uh, a quantum version of the KAM theorem, so so yes. But no. And what's the conclusion? What's the, and what, what, what's the conclusion? So if you, you perturb slightly Poisson distributed system, uh, so okay. okay. So 
specifically about the distribution, the distribution will change sort of continuously between the two. So people look for other observables where you do get some, where you, yeah. I'm, 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 okay, I'm not gonna be able to give you a good clear answer for that. I think probably because there isn't a good clear answer. In the specific context where I'm talking here, no, basically, once you turn on N, the Poisson distribution goes away, but it does go away in a sort of a, a continuous way. And it, so it, it sort of smoothly deforms from Poisson to, to, to Wigner Dyson. Yeah. Okay. That's not a very satisfactory answer, but um, yeah. maybe I can talk about it later. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, sorry. So, so I want to just give them some intuition about what the distribution should look like in the chaotic case. So in, in the chaotic case, the, the, the difference is, is that, you know, the probability of finding two levels. So again, if we're focusing now, focusing on a sector of levels that, so, you know, removing, removing this, this guy. Um, so we'll just focus on a sector of levels that don't share any global charges. So then they should all sort of repel each other. Um, and so the probability of finding them should go to zero as the spacing goes to zero. So if we assume that the, and again, this is just a sort of general assumption, but if we assume that the probability of finding another level, so if there's an energy at E and we assume, sorry, and we ask what is the probability of finding an energy at E plus S. And if we assume that that's proportional to S, so say the probability is um, uh, AS DS, um, then we can do the same computation basically, right? So we, we again, we can ask what is the probability of finding a level between um, E plus S plus DS um, and E and you just do the same splitting up. But now what happens basically as before is that, um, if, so if I look at some, if I look at some uh, little window here, so the probability, uh, so the size of this is again, S over M, but the probability of, uh, you know, its distance from, from E um, is going to be, so if I, if I label these ones, so let me call this one E plus R S over M. So the, the distance is going to be um, R S over M. So the probability is the, so the probability of not finding anyone in each of these is uh, as I say, R S over M times the size A S over M. And I sum over, or sorry, take the product over all R from zero to M minus one. Um, and then of course I want to find somebody in here. So it's A, S, D, S. Um, and then again, take the limit as M goes to zero, uh, sorry, as M goes to infinity. And in this case, you find um, that the, you, you, you get a, you get a, a, a Gaussian um, sort of thing. So you get pi over two E to the minus pi S squared over four, sorry, times S uh, DS. So this, so you, you can, so it falls off. So for large S, it falls off like a Gaussian. Um, at small S, it sort of increases linearly. And so this, this curve sort of looks something like this. I'll, I'll plot it properly in a second. Here, I've removed this factor of A by just insisting that the mean spacing is one. So I've actually, in here, I've, I've picked a particular value of A so that the mean spacing is equal to one. Um, so you, yeah, you, if you take this limit, you actually get, the, you get an A S E to the minus A S squared over two. Okay, so, so this, this is what we expect in the chaotic case. This is called the, um, well, that's a typo. Um, we call the Wigner Dyson distribution. And one thing that I actually kind of find somewhat interesting is that Wigner guessed this distribution by looking at the spectra of, of heavy nuclei. So in the 50s, this was a, you know interesting topic of, of research. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so by, by looking at the spectrum, they were interested in describing these complicated systems. And in some ways, you can kind of think of these um, multi-trace operators as somewhat like, you know, they're large, especially when we look at large lengths, they're going to be large composite um, operators that in some sense are like the analogs and nuclei. So anyway, I find the, the analogy somewhat charming. Okay, um, so there was two things though that we saw in order to get these features. So one, we have to desymmetrize. So we can only look at sectors that have the same global numbers. 
And the other thing that you can kind of see um, in the discussion is that I was assuming that the mean spacing is one. And so actually what we have to do is we have to what's called unfold the spectrum. So we're not really interested. So we're not really interested in the sort of global features of the spectrum. Rather, what we want to do is we want to um, subtract out the sort of average behavior and then look at the variation um, around um, the, the average behavior of, of the, the density of states. So in particular, what you would want to do is, you, you know, you, if you have some spectrum that has um, some, uh, so like the number of states at some given energy um, as, as a function of the energy has some sort of feature like this, you, you, you unfold the spectrum um, just to make so that the, the density is, is, is uniform. And there's a procedure for doing this, but of course, in some sense, you need to define what you mean by the average density. Um, and what I'm going to do is, is yes? Just a quick point. A, uh, so essentially, I should take uh, as a continuous parameter my capital N to flow from uh, Poisson to Wigner surmise. So everything that I'm going to yes. do is going to be numerical. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to plug in different values of N. Um, you could ask, is there a continuous distribution that, that interpolates between the two and then ask what that interpolating function as a function of N is? That would be an interesting thing. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, that's one point. But also another point, this probably Wigner surmise is not a coincidence, right? I should expect some RMT behind, right? That could describe this. Right, I mean, right, right. I mean, that's obviously what I'm going to say in, in, like, in, yeah, in two slides. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, very good. So, so, but this is the thing is, is that we're, we, we take the average density so that it's not smooth, sorry, that it's not, so that, that it is uh, level. And then we look at the differences between the, you know, the, uh, local energies um, and, and that average behavior. And again, we're just going to compute that average local, uh, sorry, numerically. So that's one thing. I actually, I'm, I guess I'm, as always, going to run out of time. So I'm, I won't describe the unfolding procedure. Um, so what that looks like then, so in order to do these two things, so again, we take our beta to form theory and we look at some fixed sector of fixed L um, with some number of impurities. We look at all possible states in, in, that, um, in that sector. We avoid this half filling, so we don't look at um, m being l over 2. Um, and I remove the protected states. So it's true that even in, 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 in the beta deform theory, there's a lot of these states that essentially have um, zero anomalous dimension, and of course their spacings are, are zero. So we remove them. Those symmetries are related by symmetry. Yep. Ixmik, can I ask a question before we go further? Uh, so about uh, about chaos, yes. Yeah? So there is another way to think about um, chaotic uh, field theory uh, yeah. in terms of uh, or out of time ordered uh, correlators and yeah. the Filipinov exponents. Yes. Yes. So is there a relation between these two things? So crossing uh, level spacing statistics and uh, sure. asymptotics of these correlators. Yeah, no, no, it, indeed. So there's different probes. So yeah, um, so I, I'm not going to talk about that. And it's not something that we've looked at. But indeed, it is related. Um, and it's a little bit more related to. So it, it measures other properties of the spectrum. So you know, when you calculate these, um, these time dependent things, you, you know, the time dependence is governed by the differences in energies, for example. And so you, you, you were probing different correlations between different energies. And so, yeah, so you, if you, you, can, you can extract the same information from looking at correlations of energy levels. Um, and I'll say, well, I'll say one sentence about that in a second, but really, if you want to know the answer, you'll have to, well, not the answer. Let me, again, maybe that's best addressed in, in, in later. Sorry, I mean, yeah, I'm not going to talk about OTOCs here. It is something you could look at. It is related, um, but it's not something I'm going to talk about. Okay, so. Crystal, may I also ask a question? Okay. Uh, so uh, as far as I remember, Wigner's surmise is uh, very similar, but not exactly the what you get in uh, random matrix right. theory. So the difference probably is very small, but um, uh, so do you compare your data to 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 Wigner or to to Matthew? Wigner yeah no so yeah I, I so we, we do actually try to do fits to curves and things like this and the fits that we do we do to Wigner to the Wigner Dyson 
you're right. You're right that it, absolutely. So um, again, I, I will describe a little bit about RMT in, in a minute, but not really um, like in any detail. But um, the our our statistics are probably not accurate enough to be able to tell the difference between the two. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So. So here, in some sense, in graphical form, are some of our results. So here, I'm looking at, and now I think I've actually forgotten. I think I'm looking at L is equal to 16, M is equal to 7 states. Um, and I'm looking at two different things. So here, this is the uh, N is equal to infinity case. And, and here, actually, I'm not looking at, um, at all operators. Here, I'm only looking at single trace operators. And that's because in the in the planar limit, the, the single trace and the double trace, um, and, and all the other multi-trace operators, they decouple from each other. And so those operators are now independent of each other. So if you want to look at the statistics of sectors, you know, basically the number of traces in your operator becomes a good quantum number in the planar limit. So in the planar limit, you only look at single trace sectors. So, so this is the, the statistics. statistics will be different, right? If you mix them, because again? statistics of the level uh, distances uh, will be different if you mix them in, even though yeah. they don't interact, but uh, they will affect the distribution. Yeah, no, it, they will. So what will happen is, is that you'll, if you calculate the spacings, you'll find like a super high peak around small, uh, around, around the, um, around zero spacing, it, I don't know, super Poisson, I don't know what it is. Um, but, but as I say, you, you really should, given that in the planar limit, the number of traces is a, is a good quantum number, you really should desymmetrize by including that. Oh, but is this probably, you, you mean if you, mm, if you include protected grids, if you include double traces, it won't create a big peak at uh, zero no, does, coupling. The energy levels, really? the energy level. So again, for the anomalous parts, they 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 sort of they are independent of each other, and so you will find yeah, pairs. So they add together, right? What? So they add together, like you have a length sixteen, and you can break into two and add them together. So there will be different number generated, right? The different sets of numbers. Ah, well, it depends. Sorry, it depends a little bit what you do. Of course, if you calculate the spacings in each sector and then calculate the distribution for all the different sectors, then, then you'll get Poisson, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Then, then that will be unchanged, yeah. So the, set, the distribution is essentially the same in each sector, yeah. But, yeah, okay. But, uh, sorry, Tristan, uh, but then how do you want to compare between, you know, if, if you want to go from n equals infinity to finite n? Yeah, so, okay, so, so if you want to do it as a smooth thing, you would need to go from large n to, to, to yeah, so again, the infinite n is a special point, right, where, um, so I'm not going to try and interpolate between the two. I, I, you, you can plot it as, like, for different values of n, and you will see that for large n, so here, okay, so this, this is, um, this is n is equal to 16, um, and you can see that the curve is, is, Quite, so this this blue curve is this um, e to the minus s squared s with the appropriate factors of pi that I on the previous slide. And here we are considering all multi-trace operators. Um, and, and you can see that the, the dots, I don't know, they, they lie pretty close to the blue. You can do a bit better and like ask how good a fit it is and, and so on. Um, and it's pretty good. Yeah, I don't, the numbers are in, in the paper and in the paper to come up. You, you, if, you, if you sort of start uh, increasing n, um, what will happen is you'll see that the, the dots will sort of start to, to move, basically. And, and eventually, you, know, you, you will find that they, they start to move in this direction. Um, so in, in that sense, you can study how the curve changes um, as, a, as a, you know. But again, I don't have an analytic expression. That's but again, why, why should they coincide if one include only a single trace and another one includes no. everything? Sorry, this one, in, okay. So this one includes everything. And if you change n, yeah, the yeah. trace states will cross with each other. Single no, that's, uh, my point is, why don't we look at something which it should match to if n is all right, because there will be lots of, uh, there will be infinitely many of operators. Uh, no, actually. No, no. I mean, well, the, the number of operators is fixed by, by L, right? L and M, basically. As, soon as, as long as we're assuming N is greater than L, which is another point I want to take. So, 
actually, just a second, we actually are more or less already on the level of uh, coffee break. So yeah, yeah. Okay. we can ask questions a bit later. Yeah, probably. exactly. Okay, so let, let me just, uh, let me just so, so let, yeah, exactly. Let me just say a couple of things. I, I don't have too much more, oh, anyway, okay. Um, so the point is, is that you can see the graph, the, the dots, the spectrum of um, the beta deformed theory lies pretty close. You, just very briefly, you can look at the undeformed theory. And then, as I said, you have to remove um, the other symmetries. So for example, there's states that are related by the SU2 symmetry. You have to look at this a definite values of this parity. And this means that the, like for, for a given L and M, you have fewer states. So the statistics is not so good. But nonetheless, the curve is, is still, I think this is L is equal to 17, M is equal to six. But at fine, sorry, and here N is, is 17 the curve is still quite clearly um, Figner Dyson. You can do a couple of other things. If I include the two loop dilatation generator, the finite N two loop dilatation generator, you can include different values of the, the coupling G and it doesn't really make any sort of noticeable difference. The curve is still essentially the same. Um, and you can look in the SL2 sector. I think this is length L M is equal to seven. Um, sorry, L is equal to 11. Um, again, you need to remove primaries, but, but the point anyway is, is that as a quite general feature, um, the spectrum of, of spacings um, satisfies or quite closely follows this, this distribution. Okay. But I'm a bit confused. Uh, two loop dilatation operator, is it integrable or not? It's not integrable, right? It's integrable up to the terms high and G. So strictly speaking by itself, we don't define already an integrable theory. No, so I, I guess I'm not, I, I'm not saying that the two-loop dilatation is integrable. Sorry, I mean... Yeah, yeah so it so, should already exhibit chaotic behavior uh, even in the planar zone. Like what? Like, uh, if you just uh, take a, a sum of one-loop dilatation and two-loop dilatation, right? Yeah. By itself, it's not integrable operator, right? It's integrable up to higher orders than G, I sure. guess. So, so, my, my, so the then according to your logic, it should already exhibit uh, chaotic behavior, even without going to finite terms. In the planar limit, maybe. The point actually that I want to make is that the distribution as a function of G is essentially unchanged. So I, when I add in the two loop non-planar dilatation operator, when I look at the level spacing statistics, they remain unchanged. Yeah, I, I'm gonna run out of time, so, but- Yeah, but my, my, my point, so, Presumably, it should change even in the planar limit because it's already chaotic in the planar limit. If you just took not the Heisenberg spin chain, but Heisenberg spin chain plus Lydian term in be. the next. Yeah, term. I guess that's perhaps true. Mm. So actually, no, I'm not sure. Well, in any case, yeah, I'm not. The only point I'm trying to make is, is that if you add in the dilatation operator, um, the two-loop dilatation operator, it doesn't actually change the form of the, the level spacing statistics. And it's the same in the SLT. Yeah, so it is a bit uh, counterintuitive statement because I would expect it would change uh, at Sorry, uh, it, the planar limit. So in the planar limit, there should be a change if you consider two-loop dilatation operator because once again, it's not an integrable system. If you just truncate your dilatation operator at two loops strictly, it's not an integrable Hamiltonian. Okay. I would say. Um, one, one loop is integral because Heidenberg, we know it's integral. Yes, yes. But two loop is not such spin chain, which is two loop uh, uh, gives you two loop Hamiltonian, right? Yes. There's like an Azemtov, which an expansion gives you two loop, but there is no spin chain which would give you strictly two loop Hamiltonian. So it's not an integrable system by itself. And already on planar limit, you should see Wigner Dyson. Mm. Well, if something is not integrable, it doesn't mean that it is chaotic. Yes, maybe it's something. Right, exactly. That's what I'm trying to think now. Um... But, but maybe we will start coffee break actually. Okay, I mean, uh, can I, well, oh, let me see. Yeah, okay, let's start the coffee break then later. Um, yeah, okay. Sorry, it's a bit hard to advance fast with us. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, but, uh, uh, that's the trouble with giving an interesting talk, Tristan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I read the thing about the spectrum.
Mm. But, but can I ask a question yeah. related to the previous slide? Okay? Yeah. Also okay. related to um, Collier's question. Okay. So these G's, they are the coupling constant of n equals four. Or what? Uh, yeah, G is uh, yeah lambda over yeah. sixteen. Okay. But, but then shouldn't you see from this distribution uh, in accordance with Collier's say that when G gets larger, then it gets further and further away from the Poisson distribution? Right. This here is not the Poisson distribution. This is the Wigner Dyson distribution. Or let me pause the recording. Yeah. Please. Okay. Um, so yeah. Um, in so the these statistics that I, I showed. So first of all, they're quite universal. The point, my point is that they, you, you, you can, you see them in different features of n equals four, but much more than that, they're universal across lots of different physical systems, from condensed matter systems to, as I say, nuclear physics. Um, but in particular, they're shared by, by random matrix theory. So if you consider, um, and I guess I'm, I'm gonna be quite quick, because yeah, otherwise I'm, I'll never get to say the, sec the second part of my talk. Um, the uh, real symmetric matrices. Um, and if you consider that the, uh, the entries are independent variables who, with, whose probability distribution is given by um, uh, the, this Gaussian function, um, this describes GOE random matrix theory. And in this case, you can study the spectrum of eigenvalues and the spectrum of spacings um, is quite well approximated by this Wigner Dyson distribution. It's not actually the same, but it's quite well approximated. You can actually consider other ensembles. So instead of just considering um, matrices, so here the probability distribution is um, invariant under orthogonal transformations. So the, the matrices are real and symmetric, but you can consider other ones. You could consider um, uh, the so-called unitary um, ensemble or the symplectic ensemble. Um, and these result in different uh, distributions. Um, so here one is, is GOE, two is, is GUE, and, and, and four is GSE. Um, and the distribution of levels, it, it, still, it still has this e to the minus s squared feature, but you get a different, the, the linear, sorry, the, like the near zero part is, is given by some different power. Um, and the point that I wanted to, to make is, is that in all of the part, things that we've looked, the n equals four seems to be described by, by GOE. So that, that, uh, that was the, the point. And the different ensembles- You look just in SU2 uh, sector, yes? So we looked at the SU2 sector and the SL2 sector. And the SL2. Yeah, but I agree, I, I'm not, yeah, so I should, in the sectors that we've looked, which are both rank one sectors, yeah, I mean, it's, we've only looked at some tiny little parts, but to the degree that we've looked, um, we always find GOE. Um, this is probably because the, the mixing matrix is sim real and symmetric. So actually, this is one thing though, right? The mixing matrix calculated with the sort of scalar product coming from the two-point function is not symmetric. So our, our, our matrix actually is not, it's real, but it's not symmetric because of this, we choose this odd scalar product, but it's true, the, yeah, it, there is a scalar product with regard to which it is real and symmetric. But I think actually the answer is, there's more, a more physics answer maybe in that, GOE ensembles are meant to describe systems with uh, rotational and time reversal symmetry, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's the, that's the point actually. So, so um, yeah, so you, 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 can, you can show that there is a discrete symmetry basically corresponding to time reversal symmetry. But the, isn't time reversal related to the fact that the Hamiltonian can be made real? It's by, yeah. just by definition? Yeah. Um, but okay, so I mean, I, yeah, I don't know which way you want to think of as more fundamental. As I say, I kind of thought of the symmetry as being the reason, but okay. And, and then once you have that, you can, you can, yeah, okay. Right, good. Um, so, so that was, that's, that's the one point. Um, the second thing is, is that th there is this sort of, yeah, the, actually even the definition of what quantum chaos is, is a little bit tricky. So there's this sort of, I guess, famous conjecture by Bohigas, uh, Giannoni and Schmidt, um, that a quantum chaotic system is essentially one whose fluctuations are described by random matrix theory. So it's, it's maybe perhaps in some sense a little bit circular, um, but uh, that's, that. okay, this I should have, I should have crossed out because that's apparently um, not right, but, but it is true that if, if Anna does give a talk, she will talk about the- Sorry, way. Tristan, just yeah. a quick point is that, because I'm exactly wondering what you call genuine uh, randomness. So essentially, when, whenever you, in your case, whenever you get the Swigner semicircle 
uh, such as fine distribution, you, yeah, you, you, then you can, I mean, your, your parameter flows, your, your capital N, and then you can say that the, the, the real chaos is coming. I mean, what, what that means, I mean, and this Jan Mills chaos is, is coming inside, right? When you can say that the chaotic, the system starts being chaotic. I mean, is uh, that- I, say, I can't give you a firm, like, answer on this. I don't have analytic control. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even qualitatively, uh, you, you understand. Of course, I understand that uh, from the numerics, you cannot exchange it. Yeah. I, I, okay. We, even, even from the numerics, I haven't tried to pin that. Like, yeah, I'd have to have actually some sort of measure of, of, of the fit, like at some point. So, you know, I can compare the spectrum to the GOE and I can say, you know, the fit is this. And then I guess you could say at some point, you know, there's some threshold where the fit is not good enough, and I haven't I haven't explored this. Um, yeah, I, I, probably... I, don't, I don't have a measure of where. My, as I say, my 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 informal intuition is is that it happens for exponentially large um, for exponentially large n. But I, I don't. I really do think it's the dimension of the Hilbert space that's the controlling thing. But I don't have a. I don't have more than that. Okay. Um, uh, propose, let's like reduce number of questions to give chance and I myself promise to shut up as well. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, yeah. Um, I guess, oh yeah, okay. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the, 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 so if we assume, if we make the conjecture that random matrix theory is describing the spectrum, th there's a whole bunch of other observables and you know it, it tells you something about not just nearest neighbor energy levels but you know longer range correlations and one of the quantities that you can compute <clears throat> is the spectral rigidity which measures exactly these sort of um, longer range correlations and we've done this and indeed um, again in in the sectors that we've looked at we find that it agrees with the GOE RMT. Another thing that you can do is it makes predictions for the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian so for example if we choose a, a generic basis um, the, uh, the eigenstates can be written in that, the energy eigenstates can be written in that basis, and we can compute what the entropy is. And this sort of gives a measure of how um, mixed the states are or how delocalized the energy state is in this particular basis. And again, GOE gives a prediction for, for, what, the, um, for the, what that entropy is. Um, and we can do the same thing. So here I'm looking at, uh, as I say, um, the, it's similar, so length 16, m is equal to 7, and um, here in this, in this graph I have n is equal to 16 and uh, m is equal to 10 to the 12. So the yellow is 10 to the 12, the blue is um, 16. Um, one here is the GOE, so I, I'm measuring the entropy of the um, energy eigenstates with regard to the multi-trace basis, so you know, I write my states as some linear combination of multi-trace states, I read off the coefficients and I compute the entropy. And then for all of the different um, energy levels, so that's what, what you're seeing here. So on the bottom is the energy, the eigenstates organized by their, um, by their energy. And on, on this side here, you're seeing, you're seeing the entropy. And you can see that the the finite n states, the entropy is generally higher. It's relatively close to one. So one is, is sort of here. So it's quite high. Um, it's quite thin. You don't get fluctuations. As you go from state to state, the entropy is not changing a lot. Um, it does tail off. Um, and this sort of feature, it, compared to other chaotic systems, for example, like if you take the spin chain and add some disorder into it, and as long as you keep the disorder relatively low, you would actually find something that looks maybe something more like this. You, so it's quite common to find this uh, non-chaotic behavior in the tails. So we sort of see that sort of feature. Um, yeah, okay, let me not, uh, here, this is, this is n is equal to four for the same states. So we, we have this reduced Hilbert space where we take into account all the relations between the traces. Um, and you can see that it's, so there's fewer states because the Hilbert space is smaller, but it's quite uniform actually. It, it really is, um, uh, yeah, remarkably uniform as a function of the energy. There's a lot of other things that you can say from random matrix theory about thermalization of states. Um, you know, the predictions of random matrix theory tell you that the observables should satisfy the microcanonical ensemble and all sorts of things. So there really is a huge amount um, that we can we can say. Um, 
we've only really begun to study some of the very, very big beginning bits of it. Um, what we want to do, so, okay, so based on what we found, um, we're, we're going to make the conjecture that uh, n equals four super Young Mills and beta deformed is chaotic at finite n and is described by GOE or MT, so that there is this universal behavior that corresponds to this integral. That's at least something you could um, study. If we included a theta term, there's a comment in a paper by Kotler et al from, from a while back where they say that a theta term which breaks time reversal symmetry um, would result in statistics which are GUE. So that's perhaps the case. There's interesting other information um, for people have studied. Uh, so this, this group here um, recently, I mean, after our paper, but so quite recently, um, they, uh, they looked at um, operators whose dimensions, whose bare dimensions go like n squared. So they studied in the n squared limit in the UN theory and they use these so-called restricted sure polynomial bases. And they, in that case, you can get quite a nice model, this um, graph Hamil Hamiltonian model. I'm not so familiar with the details, but they, they actually do find some very nice results and they find evidence of chaos in, 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 in n equals four. Um, of course, one of the things is that you would expect that this might be true at lambda, right? That the system should be chaotic. Um, because we expect operators whose bare dimension goes like n squared should be dual to black holes. So we should perhaps be able to see um, some, uh, yeah, okay. Right, so two things. W one thing that I think is important is that the theory at finite n is generic, right? So that's quite good, it's not so special. We're, so we might be able to learn things about general QFT from n equals four in the non-planar limit. The bad part, of course, is that it's generic. It might be very, very hard. So the second part of my talk, um, and I guess maybe I should ask the organizer. So what, what is, when should I make sure I stop? I guess maybe Kalia is the, or. Tristan, how long do you think you need? Yeah, so I mean, <laughs> uh, I guess it's, I mean, I, yeah. It, I need more time than there probably is. I guess if I, if I have a target, I can make sure I hit it just to try and describe the key points. So will I say, so what, what is like 15 minutes, 20 minutes? I think 15 minutes would be all right, yeah. All right, okay. So the, the next thing that we wanted to do, and, and in some sense, this of the, the previous paper, this was the bigger part of the work, although the paper to come is about, is, is other questions about the statistics. Um, is can we actually use the planar integrability to actually compute things in the non-planar theory? Can we use the planar integrability to organize the non-planar contribution? And so our strategy for this was to diagonalize the planar dilatation operator using the integral basis. Of course, this is what we know. The, the beta states diagonalize the, the, dilata uh, the, the planar um, dilatation operator, and then just to try and compute the corrections perturbatively in one over n, right? So now I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not talking about finite m, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm talking about doing sort of perturbative calculations. And in some ways, this is, I mean, obviously we're not the first people to have this idea. It's, a, it's an obvious idea. Um, you, you can just use quantum mechanical perturbation theory, right? So you can, um, you can find the one over n corrections by um, uh, computing the overlaps, so here V plus um, is the, the overlap of, of H plus. Um, so I have some beta state. So I have some beta state, which is characterized by some set of momenta P. Um, and I have to compute the overlap of that state with an, any other planar state. Um, and so I can compute these matrix elements, or if I can compute these matrix elements, um, and then I, of course, have to compute the, so this is sort of like H plus, I have to compute H minus, I have to calculate the overlap of the H minus part of my Hamiltonian, the part that reduces the number of traces. Um, and then I need to divide by the difference between the energies, and then I need to sum over all the beta states. Um, and so, you know, pictorially, so if, I, you know, here we're going to focus on calculating the, the one over N corrections to the single trace states. Um, so I have some single trace states. It will mix with some double trace states. Um, and so I need to sum over all intermediary double trace states. But of course, the idea is more general. But what we're going to talk about, that's what we're going to focus on for the moment. 
So of course, the question is, is, are there nice formulas for these objects, right? So of course, you can do this, but are there nice formula? Um, and one of the things that we did was we calculated a formula um, for, for these overlaps. So that was one of the things. And in some ways, the structure, like the formulas are not so pretty. I've written it here in, in perhaps the most schematic way. But in another way, they really, they're not, they're not very complicated. Um, so if we consider um, the, uh, the case of a single trace operator um, and we want to calculate its overlap with a double trace operator. And so here I'm sort of thinking of the, the double trace operator joining into the single trace operator. And the dilatation operator will basically just, um, so here I have one double trace operator with momenta, uh, momenta all the different magnons have momenta Q. I have another uh, trace that has um, magnons with momentum R and my big trace has momenta uh, P. And the dilatation operator will just pick out um, some excitation. So let's call that QI. And it'll join it up with some, um, uh, what do you call, um, excitation on the single trace operator. So let's call that PJ. And it'll also pick some leg um, from uh, like some you know, spin up. So using the usual spin chain sort of picture, it'll pick some sp um, spin from my R chain and it'll join that with um, a, a, a spin up on the, on the single trace. And it'll shift them around. And it basically shifts them around in exactly the same way as it does in the planar limit. So you get some sort of, so you get the basically the, the planar Hamiltonian density. So that's this feature here. And in, so here, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm looking at the overlap of this double trace uh, with my single trace. And so here, you know, it, it acts on each leg. Um, so I have to sum over all the legs. So there's a sum over I um, here, summing over all of the, magnons in, in Q. I have to sum over all the excitations on the single trace. So I have a sum over J. I split up um, my, my big trace into two groups. So basically by sort of picking um, a magnon, it's sort of splitting the trace into two parts. So I split it into groups S and T. So these are the subsets of the remaining um, magnon momenta. Um, and so it's going to, you know, so I have to sum over all the different possible ways. I act on the legs with essentially the planar Hamiltonian density. The remaining legs are just contracted with each other. And so they're just contracted using um, beta overlaps. So these are just off shell uh, beta scalar products. So, of course, you know, all of them. Uh, momenta satisfy the beta equations, but they satisfy them, you know, not for these subchains, right? So here you can see, you know, this this chain, the Q, the Qs um, are on a chain where I picked out one of the the legs, and so they no longer satisfy the appropriate beta equations. So in general, these are off shell um, scalar products. Um, I have the Hamiltonian density, and then there's one other thing. It 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 drags, you know, when, when it takes a magnon, it sort of drags it around before joining it up again. And so you get, you get phases um, that basically just describe you know, here. So I really should draw this picture as it sort of, it takes a magnon and then it sort of drags it around, brings it out, drags this one around and then joins it up again. And so, yeah, there's, there's sort of this, this, yeah. The phases are not so um, kind of complicated. So for example, if I take uh, this, this phase here, um, it's just given in terms of the S matrix. Um, yeah, maybe. Um, products of the S matrix. So I get um, these factors of, of H. So the, the S matrix um, IJ is just written in terms of these uh, H functions, HJI. So if I have the scattering matrix for two magnons, I can write it as a product of terms, and that's what these h's are. Here, I have a h1 for each. Um, so it takes qi, and it scatters, again, it scatters, it scatters it against all of the other um, magnons. So I get one factor of h for each of those. There's an e to the minus i um, 
LQ plus one S. So here S is all of the magnons on um, like half of the, of the chain. As I say, the chain gets split into two parts before it kind of gets joined. And so each of those picks up a phase sort of by bringing it around length LQ plus one. And then as it does that, it also kind of scatters against, so it scatters the PJ uh, magnon against all of the others. So it scatters it against all of the ones in S, it scatters it against all of the ones in T, so all the ones, so it's kind of going all the way around. Um, and, and then it actually- but, but All these factors are already in hexagon uh, procedure, right? Okay, so I, I'll, I'll, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's very similar to the hexagon and that, that will be my next point, but um, yeah, but right. So, um, okay, so good, so, so, so indeed. So, so these factors, they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're, you know, you can, you can find explicit expressions for them. You can write them down. These, these various things are now all pretty computable. The off-shell beta products, of course, have a formula due to Koropin. Um, so yeah, the, these things are given as, again, sums over partitions of these, uh, again, determinant factors, right? So uh, yeah, I'm gonna be quite quick given that I'll probably run out of time. Um, but there, there are relatively efficient ways of calculating these, um, these scalar products. Um, and so, yeah, the structure is, yeah, okay. I, I, anyway, I, maybe I shouldn't say too much more. Um, it gives a relatively efficient way of calculating them. The thing that the colleague just mentioned, of course, is that they also look quite similar to um, the factors that you find in hexagons. And of course, even from a cartoon level, you know, we saw that I had this graphical representation where you're taking a single trace, you know, splitting it um, into sort of two pairs of pants diagrams. And so it's natural to ask, right, I have a pair of pants diagram. Can I write that as a hexagon? Can I cut? Can I cut it again using the sort of thing that we've been, or the people have been doing for for years? And we know that like the uh, the three point function. So I can write the structure constants for the three point function as again sums over partitions, where I have these various splitting factors, um, I have these bridge lengths, and then I have these these hexagon factors. And one key thing about the hexagon factors is is that they satisfy these. Um, Sort of bootstrapping properties, right? So in particular, they satisfy a Watson equation. So if I have some sort of hexagon, um, this is equal. So if I have two U and V, um, if I have U and V, it's, you know, like if I put in a factor of the S matrix, you know, if I exchange two of the legs, um, the, the thing is the same. Um, you also have a decoupling identity where uh, if you have two magnons that form a singlet, um, as their momenta sort of, if you, if you look at the residue as the momenta approach each other, you get this decoupling identity. And then one, of course, and perhaps the most important one is you have these crossing relations. Now we don't have the crossing relations um, because we're considering only um, finite G, or sorry, uh, infinitesimal G. Um, but we can consider, you know, we can look for objects which satisfy the um, Watson identity and the decoupling identity. Okay, so the thing is, can we take our, these overlaps and can we write them in terms of hexagons? And the answer is kind of. Um, so that's just the same thing again. At, at a very simple mechanical level, you can understand that you can, there's like an identity that allows you to write the quantities, the determinants that appear in the scalar product in terms of the hexagon. This relation between the hexagon and the, and the, the Corpins formula, the scalar project was, is, is known, it's, it's in the original um, hexagon paper. Um, but at the level that we're studying, so at this sort of, you know, uh, it's, it's essentially tree level. It's a tree level identity, even though we're looking at the one loop things. It's, it's, it's sort of a, yeah, a simple relation between these objects. And you can try and use the same manipulations that lie behind this, uh, this identity to rewrite the overlaps um, in terms of uh, similar quantities. And indeed, you can do that. So you can use similar manipulations to show that the overlaps can be written as sums over partitions. So again, I sort of take, um, you know, if I look at my, my overlap, I 
you know, I have three sets of momenta. I partition them into different groups. So I'm, I'm doing some sort of cutting. Um, I have various uh, splitting factors. Um, one important point is, is that one of the splitting factors, one of the bridge lengths is zero. And that's to do with the fact that in some sense, we're looking at the extremal case. So here, um, L, sorry, LP is equal to LQ plus LR. So we sort of have an extremal um, object. Then the objects that appear in our overlaps, so one of them really does look like just the, the hexagon feature. And then you find other objects, H1 and H2, and, and they're sort of a similar term. And these, these quantities are not in any obvious way the same as this hexagon, but they do satisfy the, these same relations, these uh, crossing, sorry, every, uh, decoupling and the, the Watson equation. Now, in some sense, this is just, like, I don't have a good physics reason for this. The cartoon suggests it. You can work relatively hard, and you can get things that, that look um, like this. And so there is a certain picture. But whether it's the correct picture, that's a little bit hard to know. One thing that we were discussing, and um, this also actually comes from the referee, is that it might be better to consider the octagon. The octagon actually might be a, a more natural object but that we haven't haven't done. Okay. Um, this actually works. In order, of course, the thing you would want to do, of course, is that you then would want to use these overlaps to actually compute a nominal dimension. And there's two big problems here. One is, is that um, the formula I wrote down is for the non-degenerate case, right? So it's non-degenerate perturbation theory. If there's degeneracies, you can't use that form uh, directly, and you have some non-trivial mixing problem that you have to solve. And the second thing is that the sum over intermediate states, I mean, we all know this, right? It's, it's well known that sums over, over beta states, it's a complicated problem. The people work on it, there are techniques, but it's, it's a complicated problem. So as just a proof of concept, we wanted to try and compute something, to compute something new, whether we could, where we could use the um, objects that we'd found to compute something new. And in some sense, we can look at the, it probably is the simplest case, right? You can look at the simple two excitation case in the beta deformed theory in the BMN limit. And this solves both the problems that we have. It solves the degeneracy case. The deformation lifts um, these sort of accidental degeneracies that you find in the planar limit. Um, so we can find non-degenerate uh, states. It actually is even nicer in, in another way is that in the, in the spectrum, you know that there are singular states, and the beta def deformation resolves the singular states. So our formulas can be generalized to include singular states. And by looking at the BMN limit, it allows us to carry out the sum over intermediate state states because, well, because it's relatively simple. Um, and, um, but perhaps more fundamentally, in the semi-classical limit, and sort of the BMN limit is like a is essentially a semi-classical limit, you can replace the sum um, with an integral. And this perhaps is, points to where these sort of formulas would be most useful um, if, you, uh, if you consider semi-classical states. If you wanted to calculate 1 over n corrections in some sort of semi-classical limit, it's perhaps most likely that you'll be able to carry out the sum over intermediate states in that limit. Indeed, in the study of quenches, um, where you have a similar problem. This quench action approach, in some ways, allows you to replace the sum over beta states with a, an integral, although that's a much more complicated thing than what we did. OK. Um, yeah, let me, not, let me not describe it. You have to combine all of the different ter terms. You have to sum, organize all of your intermediate states. You convert your sum to an integral. Um, and in the end, you find an answer. And so here um, is, 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 is the answer that we found. So this is the, um, the uh, anomalous dimension for the two excitation BMN state in the beta deformed theory. Um, this B here is the, is the beta parameter that's been rescaled. So when we take the limit, the beta limit, I have to say, um, how the, the beta parameter scales or else it will drop out. So actually what we do is we scale beta um, with L where uh, we keep beta times L divided by pi finite. Um, the G primed <clears throat> is um, essentially the, uh, 
well, it's actually well, kappa squared over n, 16 pi squared over j squared. Th this is the effect of um, uh, Yang-Mills coupling. Um, j is related, it's the charge of the state, so it's related to the length of the, the state. Um, so this here gives you sort of the effect of uh, Etoft coupling. This parameter here is the um, is the genus counting parameter. So this is essentially g squared, j squared over n. And so this gives you the correction. So this is sort of the one loop, um, one over n correction um, calculated to subleading order in, in the length. So um, essentially the, the leading order term, so well, this is just the one loop piece, but the, 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 the one over n part, the, the leading term was known. This was calculated many years ago. Um, um, and we managed to calculate the subleading term. It's not such an important result in any way. It's just the, the main point is, is that the formulas that we have are relatively useful um, and you know, give you a generally effective method of computing things. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I've mentioned most of the things that I have here. As I say, the idea was to try and use integrability um, to organize the non-planar contribution. Um, and we find that you can indeed write the one over n correction um, or the one over n squared correction to the energy um, in terms of the planar integrable quantities. Carrying out the sums probably makes it most useful to be considering semi-classical analysis. For, for actual, you know, if you're looking at states that have finite n, it really is often just much more efficient to directly diagonalize the dilatation operator the lengths that we were able to calculate just by sticking, you know, by just using mathematics, you can get to like 16, 17, and so on. Evaluating scalar products at those lengths already becomes basically as challenging. But of course, trying to have some sort of analytic expression where you look at long lengths, then it's sort of useful. And that's the example, that's what comes apparent from taking the BMN limit. And then, as I say, there's some suggestions, and I, I don't know how maybe, you know, hints perhaps that the overlaps can be written in terms of objects which can be bootstrapped. We see sort of new hexagon like um, objects um, that perhaps, you know, with some study can, can be generalized into actual hexagons, but an alternative would be perhaps it's more useful to consider octagons, but this, this remains to be done. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let, let's unmute ourselves and thanks, uh, Tristan. Yeah, and now we have time for a few questions, comments. Could I ask, uh, would it make any sense to combine results with different L and M together? Since uh, the original argument was kind of for the full spectrum of the theory. The, the, the argument leading to Poisson distribution or to the other one? No. So as I, so well, it depends what you mean. But like um, when, when you, in order to, so the, one of the things you have to do is you have to, before computing statistics, you have to desymmetrize. You want to look at a sector that has uh, distinct quantum numbers. Um, and so L and M um, are, are certainly good quantum numbers at, um, oh, okay, I at the perturbative okay. level. And of course, what you can do is you, you, know, you, can, you can compute the statistics within each sector, and then you can combine them on a graph in some sense. And, and that, will be, you know, that will give you more states. But, but yeah, the, like it, if you're asking about correlations between neighboring levels, right? Because that's what, in some sense, what you're asking. What is the correlator between two neighboring levels? You should only consider neighboring levels that have the same charges. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and uh, I should say that, that that's standard. I mean, that, that's not something unique to n equals four. That, I mean, that's just, yeah, that's how you always have to do these things. Uh, Tristan? Yep. Uh, in your chaotic eigenstate construction, did you consider n dependence coming from normalization of operators? Um, I, do you, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Do you mean something like, so if I look at the tree level two point function, if I, if I want to make sure that the two, le, the, the, the two point function is correctly norm, the tree level two point function is correctly normalized. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. But in that case, the, we can have some one over N, one over N square dependence. Uh, yeah. No. So that, 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 that's right. So, and, and that's actually quite important. And, and this also slightly maybe goes back to the point um, that, 
Koskia was asking me. So I, if, I'm probably going to get this wrong because I'm trying to do it in my head. But if I have two operators and I calculate their two-point function, um, I guess uh, you know it's something like delta zero uh, one plus t. Oh, am I getting this wrong? Yes, I'm getting it wrong. Um, t a b log of x, right? Um, and the dilatation. So s and t are symmetric. Um, and D, which is, I guess, T S inverse, D is not symmetric. Um, so in that sense, that's why our matrix is, is, is not symmetric. We, so this is what we compute. We don't compute T. Um, and indeed, in the, in the basis of multi-trace operators, S is, is non-trivial. Yes, yeah, so, so our basis of operators has a non-trivial S. Um, I see, and I see. It would, actually, I, I mean, maybe this is why you're asking. I, I think in order to understand the eigenstates, it probably makes sense to work in a basis where S is, um, is diagonal. And indeed, that would make, so you know, the, these, um, uh, what do you call it, like the, the, the sure polynomial basis is exactly, you know, it gives you that. And so that probably is a good idea. Um, and we've looked into it a little bit, but there's different, there's, there's, yeah, I mean, We have a question from Christian. Um, so uh, I have a question about your Beeman results. So okay. um, can you relate them to string theory in some way? I don't know, string mm. theory. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we haven't tried. Um, uh, can you render them in the language of string field theory. I thought that's what I had done. Haven't I written it in terms of, well, I've written it in terms of these variables that people used back in 2003, right? Uh, this G primed and, and G2 squared. I, I thought these were the, the, the parameters that people used. So, well, um, my question was more about the structure of the, of the, I don't know, Hamiltonian or correction ah, of the energies like, um, um, uh, the dynamics. Yeah. No, it, it's a good question. And, and I mean, it's something, well, no, I mean, it, it's, it was something I, I wanted to look at, or I do want to look at. I just I haven't um, gotten to do it. Uh, so, I mean, there's a couple of obvious things. Like one, I don't really know if anyone ever thought about it. So, I mean, I guess people looked at like cone string field theory calculations, right? And that would give you the BMN limit. Um, I don't think anyone ever really looked at backing off, like to try and perturbatively calculate the light cone string field theory Hamiltonian perturbatively, um, like in the near BMN limit. I, I don't know, if maybe people did, but I don't think they did. And that's what you would need, of course. That, that's, that's what I'm saying, you know, these, these quant that's what this quantity is, right? That's in some sense the new number. Um, and if, I, I don't know why you couldn't do it, um, but it might be some work. Um, right to, to try and so it wouldn't be quite hard it if you're talking about a correction to the BMN uh, yeah. plane wave string field theory yeah yes. yeah no I exactly I, I mean and, and, and like here we also have um, I mean you, you can actually set the deformation to zero but you know if you really wanted to match the full thing you would need to calculate the uh, near plane wave light cone string field theory in the beta deformed geometry. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, in the end, it might like, it, yeah, okay, so I- Yeah, I so it's, an, it's, a, it's a, probably an easier question just to do the plane wave beta deformed string field theory. Because I'm not okay. sure that people yeah. did that. So, so, uh, so the only problem with that is, is that the, the one over n correction does not involve beta, so you should find zero. I mean, <laughs> I mean, the other thing, like the other thing we have is you'll find the number two. I, I mean, the, you know, if, if it was an interesting thing, we could probably work harder and get more numbers. But but yeah, but but it, that is what this presumably should compare with. Now, of course, you would also have the, the usual problem with comparing BMN things that. Um, you know, it, it, you're comparing two different ends. There's this double scaling issue. You might get lucky and they agree, but actually you're not guaranteed that they agree. So if they didn't agree, I don't know whether you'd have a, like, 
you know, you wouldn't be able to make a sharp statement that it doesn't agree. You'd just be like, well, maybe the non-renormalization theorems don't hold or something like this. Or maybe someone smarter can say something better. Um, so in string field theory, the, the main object is string vertex, right? So that you, you need to find its matrix element between three string states. Yeah. And I wonder how, how is it related to the, uh, this, to the um, hexagon like functions that you found? Or is there any relation? Oh, okay, so that's true. So, Yeah, so that's probably also a better question. Or sorry, uh, um, so I guess this this work by um, Yannick and uh, uh, Banyak and Yannick, right, where they have some constraint, they have they basically in some sense found the ADS. Well, of course, they didn't find it entirely, but you know, they, the, the 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 string vertex. And so you could ask, how is that related to what we found? And I have to admit that that I actually don't know because like. There you, there, remember that in their case, it was very important to uh, to consider extremal correlators. So that yeah. the, they um, their formalism is tailored for extremal correlators. And for the um, for the mixing problem, the, this condition is automatic, right? So the length is much. So that's true. So we, like in that sense, we're compare, computing something similar. So we're, it's extremal. Um, and I, I, that also maybe, sorry, again, maybe someone knows better, but I, I thought like they, they made some efforts at comparing the string field vertex to the octagon, right? And that maybe was the most natural point of comparison, I think. So, and again, it might make sense to try and write what we have in terms of the octagon, and that might give you a bridge to um, what they had, yes. That I, again, we haven't done this, but but that seems like a sensible or a possible direction. I, I, I do find it a little bit confusing, and like like the tree level things that we find are not the structure constants, right? They're they're they're, they're definitely these. You know, you you can't take these mixing elements um, and write them in an immediately obvious way in terms of the structure constants. So they are slightly different. But from the string theory point of view, I just think of this world sheet with you know the the pair of pants world sheet, and then I don't know in what sense I'm supposed to dress it. Um, like, does it know whether it's feeding into a whether it's a structure constant or whether it's part of an anomalous dimension? I'm, I'm, it's not clear to me how it would know the difference. Um, yeah. Um, but as yeah, just maybe I think one thing would be is to try and relate our results to say the octagons and then the relation of the octagon to the string field vertex might be a possible direction but, and, and that would that would maybe bypass having to like actually construct the light cone string field theory which if you try to do it by hand is is yeah would be very difficult thank you maybe the last quick question and then we can press it uh after turning off the camera. Please more questions. Uh, okay, if if not, so let's uh, thanks Tristan again. Yeah, and the uh, record